men actually do.
recognizing feeling in others and then understanding. Sounds like emotional intelligence here. What else? Being able to step out of your own point of view and occupy another point of view. Let's really take another's perspective. And you're suggesting that it, it is a divorcing of your own perspective and taking another's perspective. Mm -hmm. Anything else in your definitions? Yes. Uh, seeing ourselves in the world around us. Okay. So seeing selves maybe in the experiences of others. Does that work? Sure. And uh, in psychology, we might say that empathy is feeling with, okay? So if you tell me of a story where you were super stressed and frustrated, and then I feel stressed and frustrated with you, that's empathy. If you tell me of a time when you were super stressed and frustrated and I feel bad for you, and say, oh, that sucks, then that's probably not empathy, that's more sympathy. So we're really talking about a place where we are connected and feeling with others. There's really cool uh, neurons in your brain that help you do this. They're called mirror neurons. Okay. So are we all on board with what empathy is? Yeah. Next question is, when don't you feel empathy? Or in other words, what gets in your way of feeling empathy for others? Rehashing it over and over or you just lose that. Okay, so they have an issue and they tell you about it over and over and over. At some point you might lose empathy. Yeah. Prejudices. Prejudices. So some attitude that you have that keeps you separate from others. You're distancing yourself, unable to take their perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, superficial elements like race, gender, class, sexuality, even nationality. Okay, so some of those social identities, will you say a little bit further how that's gonna stop empathy? Well, it's, uh, there are typically arbitrary barriers that, that differentiate our experiences from other people. We think that because it's happening at a distance, mm -hmm. or that it looks different from what we experience, then that, that. Then I can't, I can't feel it. We haven't had the same background. We don't have the same skin color. We're not the same gender. We must not feel or understand things the same way. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Uh, people who to power. Okay. So, like, Anybody who's willing to take a step up and be a leader of something, I have less empathy for them because they choose to do those things. And okay, interesting. So you're suggesting if you accept more power and authority, then you get less empathy for maybe the people you have power and authority over because you've stepped into that role. Okay. Uh, I guess it would be the equivalent of repetition, but being desensitized. Yes. Yeah, that feeling of desensitization where one time we might feel really in pain with another person and then we feel bad for them and then we're tired of hearing it. What I had a hunch I would hear is that um, we don't feel empathy when we're maybe fearful of the story, if we're anxious about the story or the person that we're hearing from, okay, then we distance and we're unable to feel with that person. So the second question, or I guess no, this is the third question, is when do we feel empathy? What are the conditions that really allow you to feel another person's emotion? Mm -hmm. when, like the same thing has happened to you before. Yes. So when the same thing has happened to you before, you have some shared experience. Definitely. What else? But also along with that, when you can imagine that thing happening to you. Yes. It may not have happened to you, but you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So having a shared experience is definitely not a condition for empathy, but it can help. Okay. And good news, right, that it's not a condition, because otherwise, as Jamal, right, as Jamal was saying, we'd never be able to relate to each other because my life experiences are much different from others. But if you tell me about feeling humiliated, guess what? I might have my own experience that has humiliation to it and I can join with you. So the stories are different, but the feelings are the same and then we have a place of empathy. What else helps with empathy? I was gonna, well, I'm not sure if it does or not, but I'm wondering if there's some sort of 
physical presence or being able to see the person face to face, if that would hmm. change how empathetic you are versus just hearing the story. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some research that suggests that proximity helps with a lot of things. Proximity will help with me uh, not obeying a command to hurt someone else. If I'm very close to the person, that would be hurt. Uh, proximity helps change our prejudicial attitudes. And um, I could see maybe that being a part of empathy. Yeah. So here's the question. Why is this the intro to a talk about gender and suicide? Uh, maybe that uh, a lot of people who are suicidal feel cut off from everyone else and don't feel empathy. Mm -hmm. Right, or mm -hmm. vice versa. So both both directions. Either we might feel so on the other side of an experience from somebody who has suicidal ideation that we can't empathize, or folks who are in that place also feel quite isolated, and that could be one of the contributing factors. Yeah. Where were the other hands? John? I was going to say basically the same thing. <coughs> Females are more empathetic than males. The, the whole, you know, mm -hmm. socialized, I mean, we're socialized to think that women have more empathy towards others versus males who are more cut off. Mm -hmm. So yeah, does it play into the kind of suicidal behavior we see, whereby women tend to be raised in a condition of emotional literacy, and boys and men are taught to stop that. To be able to say you're mad or frustrated, and that means every emotional experience.
And we just don't have that, that information. Okay. Make sense? It's a mouthful. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you some data. Psychologists love data. Okay. This is from our vital statistics reporting system. 2009, to break down by age of the leading causes of death in the United States. <coughs> Rates are per 100,000, which means, let's see, for 15 to 24 year olds, 10 of every 100,000 deaths are suicide deaths. Question? Yeah, for ages 15 to 24, it's the third leading cause of death for probably the age group that many of us are in. This is not. Uh, the highest proportion of suicide deaths. So if we look up into the lifespan, we actually see more people over age 65 dying from suicide than at earlier parts of our lives. Now, you notice the rank is lower, and that should make some sense because we also see an increase in morbidity and disease-related deaths in the older ages than we do in the younger ages. Okay. Um, there's some data that suggests that older white men, particularly 85 years older or above, are the ones who die most frequently from suicide. There's higher proportions of suicide in that age group. Now, here's another chart. We've got time passing on the x-axis, so years, and we have rates of suicide, fatal suicide per 100,000, broken down by gender. Will somebody here please interpret the chart? probably play a role in this, it looks like. Say that again? Culture will play a role. Maybe culture is playing a role. Yeah. So some cultural norms about suicide might play a role. It's pretty obvious, right? Who's the top line? White. White individuals. Yeah. Does that surprise anyone? No? no. Yes? Okay. Yeah, maybe. We might have some differing experiences, but yeah. Um, across the past, what, two decades or so, white people have been dying from fatal suicide more often than their contemporaries of other ethnicities. Okay. I think sometimes we hear the story that um, first people populations, Native American populations, have the highest rates of suicide, and it's not to say that they don't. There's definitely some really high rates of suicide within those populations, but taken generally across the United States population, they're not ranking number one. That's a weird sentence, right? Ranking number one for suicide. So here's what we can say is the gist of all that data. Girls and women are definitely less likely to die from fatal suicide behavior, right? They're not engaging in that kind of behavior as much. However, they are engaged in much more non-fatal suicidal behavior than boys and men. So girls and women 
women are more likely to do things that are self-injurious that don't result in death than boys and men. So what accounts for this difference? Okay, you have some ideas? Maybe the attempt and the fear prevents it. Maybe attempt and fear. Can you say a little more? Like, say as if maybe more girls or women, they, they'll do something to hurt themselves, maybe like a cut or a burn or something like that, mm -hmm. then where men more likely probably just do it, like, or like jump in front of a train or something, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so here's some data from 2002 to 2006, broken out by gender and mechanism. So the means people have chosen for their suicidal behavior. This is a little tiny, isn't it? So the green is firearms. The yellow is suffocation, hanging. Purple poisoning, balls is this weird light color, and other is the brown. That would be things like cutting or piercing, um, among others. Um, you know, depending on the study, like uh, women are more prone to talking about it, so the data is gathered from people who actually report it. Mm -hmm. Men don't tend to talk about it. So there's probably a lot more men who actually have the thoughts, but Absolutely. they don't say it. So. Absolutely. Yeah, so maybe what we should be getting up here too as we talk, I'm gonna raise the empathy stuff, is a list of what we think might be risk factors and protective factors. So risk. where it, it's hard to know the intent, right? Um, it might be. It might be one way to signify I am suffering and need some help. Um, men might also be making that call. The other thing we see, there's a book, I don't think it's out here. It's called Waking Up Alive. And it's a story of people who have survived their suicide. And some of those survivors say, I intended to die. I overdosed and had meant to die. It was definitely not a cry for help or a call for attention. So it's, it's hard to it, uh, it's hard to say we know what the intent is when somebody has died. Okay. But maybe it's a way to show pain, and maybe it's okay for women to show their pain. Would we be in agreement with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, Life stressor. 
question that you came up with, with job, achievement failure. We often think that that's the reason for men's suicide. They didn't, they didn't get something, they didn't get a promotion, they failed at their business venture. In, this was a 1990, no, 2002 study of suicide notes of 52 individuals who had died from suicide. You see 14 were women, making 38 men, okay, in the United States. What the study did was analyze the notes for those big themes to see if we could figure out why, why did these people claim that they, they were gonna kill themselves. And the hypothesis was, of course, that you'd see really different themes across the men's suicide notes and the women's suicide notes. Do you think that that was the case? No. no. Actually, this, the themes in the suicide notes were very, very similar, and the number one reason for all 52 individuals to kill themselves was the loss of a relationship, the end of a relationship. <laughs> oh, tell me about the, the tell me about that reaction. What's going on? Was it the, the end because someone died, or the end of a kind of romantic breakup? Um. Gosh, at this point, I can't remember all the details. It's written about as more a breakup. There could have been somebody who was with us, but I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. What, was that surprising to folks? No? Some of us, yes, some of us, no. Life stressors. Did you know that the number one reason that we see college men in therapy is relationship problems? So this idea that men don't care, that they're not intimate and emotionally invested and need these relationships, <laughs> Such crap. Our men really yearn for them, and in fact, when they don't have it, we see some serious behavior. It's not always suicide. Sometimes we see other externalizing behavior, like um, heavy drinking, alcohol use, other kinds of violence. Mm -hmm. I see your hand. Okay, two, yeah. Um, I, I was going to say there is actually a recent um, incident that happened to a young man from Seattle. Pretty popular uh, female rapper, and I guess they there is a rumor that uh, because the relationship ended, he ended up being suicidal. Yeah, that was pretty recent. So I think it was in, like the last few years. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. So, a recent local example that fits this idea. Yeah, Dave. Um, I was just going to say, kind of like with all the different like, uh, social goals that are like, mm -hmm. and. idea of gender scripts and suicidality. So what Ori is saying is that perhaps if we're taught to suppress feelings and to not reach out for help and to not say when we can't do something, to not say when we're really insecure about something, that might contribute to the rates of fatal suicide that we're seeing. Okay? So here we're talking about scripts for gender. Anyone from what, what the heck that means? What's a script? Yeah. 
So it's the accepted roles, feelings, interests, actions that are based on culture that we learn and we construct. Learn constructed part is a key here. So you can think of it like a script, like, oh, it's, I don't know, day, first date. What is the woman supposed to do? What is the man supposed to do? That's a script. Okay? So I'm not asking you to tell me that you believe this is how all women are and how all women should be. But what are some of the scripts that we have in the United States for femininity? Thank you. Docility. Uh, Yes. Obedience. Uh, yes. Race. Uh, uh, mother. Uh, motherhood. Mm -hmm. Being docile, obedient, submissive, graceful, elegant, nurturing. What else? Expressive. Yeah, expressive. Emotional. this idea of aggression or violence we associate with men. So if we think of the most violent ways to commit suicide, we don't usually imagine a woman engaging in those means. And, that, and the data doesn't suggest that we see women engaging in those means. And again, I, I can't stress this enough, it's not because she doesn't want to or any of those things, because we don't really know that. It seems like it's more a cultural script that we follow. Let's do the same for fatal suicidal behavior, which the literature suggests is more associated with masculinity. Okay, so now let's do the same thing. So what are some of those scripts for masculinity? We've already said a few. In the United States. Aggressive. Aggressive. Strong. Decisive. Tough. Tough is one of the first words to always come up when you ask people, what are real men like? Decisive, what else? Ambitious. Ambitious? Independent. Um, self-reliant. 
And self-reliant. Violent. Violent. Mm -hmm. In control. Quiet. Quiet. Yes. Um, in the, gosh, was it the 1970s? A psychologist came up with the guy code. This might sound familiar to some of you. No sissy stuff. Right? No sissy stuff. Oh, the guy code. Mm -hmm. Number two, be a sturdy oak. Do not show me any emotion, even when the winds are raging. Number three, be a big wheel. Get stuff done. Be self-determining. Make change. Number four, give them hell. Get in a fight when you need to. Okay. That tends to be the guy code. And unfortunately, it was in the 70s. I bet, well, I just did it, right? I just asked you what the guy code was. Doesn't sound like it's changed. Um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing is men dying more from suicide. Men are also more, more likely to die from other violence. They're more likely to be both perpetrators and victims of violence. Okay. Self-determination. Often when we write about men's suicide like in the newspaper, we say he knew his life was done and he decided to end it in his own way. We're pretty forgiving, in a way, of men's fatal suicide. I think a really great example of this, um, some of us might be a little young for, is um, Hunter S. Thompson's suicide. He was a, a journalist. His suicide, he had thought about suicide supposedly for his whole life and had this desire to end life on his own terms, and he did in a gruesome way that forced his wife to see his splattered brains. Right. And in the newspaper, we laud him. We say what a brave person. How strong. How in charge of his own life he is. And that could be the case, but I think his individual story plays into a bigger narrative of suicide and gender roles. Okay? And um, I, I guess I have to question why we applaud that kind of behavior. So just here is that the feminine gender roles, it permisses non-fatal suicidal behavior because it loads into maybe being indecisive or weak or expressive, finding a way to call for help or call for attention. And because of that, decreases risk of fatal suicide. Stereotypical feminine gender role decreases risk for fatal suicidal behavior by, in a way, increasing risk for non fatal suicidal behavior. Does that make sense? And then we can see the flip for men. So, really, that stigma of anything sissy, basically anything that is linked to womanhood, uh, steers men maybe more away from non fatal suicidal behavior and increases their risk for fatal suicidal behavior. Uh, that, that's an interesting aspect to, to, to point out, that, that it almost seems that in the sense of with women, if they survive it, then it's okay, well, it's, it's a terrible mm -hmm. thing, but if, if men survive it, then it's almost as if our society is encouraging us to pick up the gun one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. And when I started saying, I'm not going to say successful or failed or attempted, it's because we are much more likely to call men failures when they don't die from their suicide and less likely to do that to women. In that same study about attitudes towards suicide, remember I said uh, college students were harsher to judge women who died from suicide? They were also harsher to judge men who engaged in non-fatal suicidal behavior. Okay, ready? Everyone take a big deep breath in. numbers. Some are associated with King County, some more national. And in case you were wondering, I've got a little bit of data about Washington and King County. Um, and this was published in 2012, but it's, I think it's from 2010 and on. So Washington, the leading all ages cause of injury death in 2010 was suicide. It was 947 deaths. And during this same period, there were 3,736 people hospitalized for suicidal behavior who didn't die. King County 
overall, this is maybe going to be surprising. We have a lower rate than what is national. So we have a lower suicide rate than national. Okay? Even though we often think, wow, this is the gloomy place. We were one of the highest uh, places for suicide. Um, but we have been seeing an increase in the numbers. So there's been about a 25% increase since 2001 in fatal suicides in King County. Firearms most likely cause of death, then poisoning, then suffocation, then cutting and piercing. So there's seven minutes left. I wonder what questions we have. Are neighbors to the south allow suicide? For medical reasons now? Uh, so does Washington. There's a right to die. There is a right to die now. In Washington. Yeah. So, or, like, I would imagine that is going to, like, be increasing with time. Like, with age and disease or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But I don't find that that would be the same stigma. And you're right. So, people are most likely to say, I totally understood a person's suicide. I think they're very justified in their suicide when that person is older and has a chronic disease or a fatal disease. We say we, say we understand it more. Um, so I don't think we stigmatize it as much. And we are seeing that among older individuals, there are more suicides than, than younger. question. So how has that suicide rate been changing? What, let me see. There is data that's in my head, at least, about when there is greater access to lethal means, so more guns available, more of a gun culture, we see more suicides. So shockingly, Colorado, New Mexico, some of the highest rates of suicide in the nation, even though they're super sunny and beautiful. Um, and part of the reason is maybe that access to lethal means. I don't know if I can, s I don't have any stats in my head for a general trend. That's what's ever I was going to ask uh, any correlation between uh, correlation between uh, sports for people who are in suicide or in uh, media. Yeah. So what is there between sports and gender roles and suicide or perhaps media and suicide there is a pretty strong link and lots written about it fascinating stuff between sport culture and that guy code all four things are a part of sports culture right you're playing football and you get tackled and it's brutal and it of course hurts if you show your coach that it hurt he probably calls you a couple and they're probably something to do with being girly, okay? So we do see that overlap pretty strongly. Um, I don't know if there's any data that suggests that athletes have higher rates of suicide. They have very media notable suicides um, when they're professional athletes. There is some data that suggests that if there's a big suicide that's written about in the media, we see some copy suicides afterwards. Um, The, the research that I'm pulling on has a media study that, that looks more at that um, gender role. So do we show men over and over and over as these people who take their matters into their own hands in violent ways, and then that links in the same way I've been talking about the suicide rate. Mm -hmm. Odd question. It's gonna be an odd question. Other than like, say among the elderly or uh, terminally ill, do you think there's ever a situation in which a suicide is an appropriate uh, response to something in life? That's, I mean, I think that's a fascinating question. And even if you're looking at the right to die in older ages, we're not all for sure. Typically, middle to upper class, secular, white individuals say that, yes, we have the right to die. So I think the way I would answer it 
is culture totally informs our ideas about that. And there are some cultures where there's a, a, a form of suicide that's embedded either in end of life situations or dishonorable situations. And so based on where you're located within or outside of the culture, you would answer that. So like in certain cultures of honor, it might yeah. be appropriate. Huh? Yeah. Well, I'm hearing zippers. Oh, one more question. Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much for attending.